black-hearted. <laughs> oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! You know, there's a lot more to horror movies than just violence and gore, and the occasional boob. No, there are some real masterpieces in the horror movie genre that leave you with that satisfying feeling of fears and thrills. And even as a kid, I always loved those scary movies, the kind that put you in a situation that you couldn't experience in real life without putting yourself in real danger. But, as of late... Eh... Hollywood. Hollywood has been coming out with these big budget films that are meant to be scary, but feel more flat. And don't get me wrong, plenty of people have their own things they get scared over, and though I'm not your typical Joe to jump at any old ghost going, BOO! But occasionally, I still find that one horror movie that puts me in that fearful, thrilling mood, and, well, I, as someone who enjoys films and would like to make his own one day, what better way than to further my craft than to analyze the masterpieces, as well as the duds, than to dissect them and learn about them in detail. What's scary? What's lame? Let's dive into our first movie this week that captivates with surreal terror from a man who's obsessed with horror and sex. Let's talk about Dario Argento. Dario was a famous Italian film director who made his career with some big horror hits in the 70s and has since still been making more films known for the giallo genre. In Italian, giallo translates into yellow, which references to the old mystery comics with trademark yellow pages. The genre can include mostly crime and mystery, but as well as some horror and eroticism. He's built a career making films with this genre, and today we're going to take a look at one of his more popular pieces. Maybe less on the eroticism and more on the violence and the mystery. This is Suspiria. The movie starts proper with the opening credits introducing the main theme of the film. Oh, and real quick before we begin, this is a plot analytical review, so if you want a spoiler-free review, then please refer to the link below. The main track for the film starts off sounding enchanting and then turns all fairy tale themed in a creepy pedophilic kind of way. <laughs> Rather or not you like this theme, you're going to be hearing it a lot, which does add to some kind of whimsy, like crawling down a rabbit hole that you know was going to lead to somewhere really bad, but just like any good Brother Tales story. The band responsible is Goblin, an Italian progressive rock band that's worked on a few of Dario's films and that's still on and off working present day. And speaking of fairy tales, we start with a brief narration, like going all Rod Serling style. Susie Banyan decided to perfect her ballet studies in the most famous school of dance in Europe. She chose the celebrated Academy of Freeboard. One day at nine in the morning, she left Kennedy Airport, New York, and arrived in Germany at 10.40 p.m. local time. We first see our leading character named Susie Banyan, an American girl who's moved to Munich, Germany to learn dance. But on her way to school, she sees a girl running away as if in terror, whom we come to find is named Pat. As far as we know, the soundtrack could suggest she's being stalked by chanting trolls, or even Doug Funny's musical score. What did the soundtrack just say? Twit? Bitch? Twitch? Wick, girl, meh. Ah, whatever. Not like it could be some ominous foreshadowing or blatant spoilers. Of course not. She enters an unusually pink house, which has a stained glass window, and given a room to stay the night from a friend. I don't give a damn about being kicked out. Well then, it's useless to try and explain it to you. You wouldn't understand. It all seems so absurd. After being followed by mumbling rocking frackles, we get our first jump scare. Ah! Hey, why don't you close it? Followed by our first moment of silence until... Oh my god, it's the Cheshire Cat.
Sheesh. You might have guessed. The first scene is kind of a whopper. Not only does the scene take advantage of the very unique and theatrical looking set, but the pacing follows each act of violence like a beat, building up the shock and awe, and at least my reaction. When I first saw this scene, for example, I was like, Whoa! Uh, ah! Uh, ah! 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 <sighs> Shit. Perhaps one note to make is to keep the scene a surprise, allowing the audience to get invested into the scene and then to be slammed with constant shock value. But not just any shock value. The entire thing was done in an artsy way. There was color. Every angle mattered. Was meticulous. Every cringing moment stuck out and the, and the best was saved for last. And then to help us absorb the scene, we bathed in silent observation, forcing our brains to draw a clearer picture of what we just saw. Overall, job well done, Dario. Making death stick in our heads like a work of art. Even the Joker would have been proud. I make art until someone dies. See? <laughs> then we see Susie arrive at the dance school the next day, Miss Tanner's Dancing Academy, where we notice the architecture is fairly equal in vivid colors. The whole film is, in fact, pretty distinctly lit. Each room is typically lit by one dominant color similar to Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, if that weren't foreboding enough. She meets a rather diverse cast of characters that we never really get a lot of time with. There's the stern Madame Blanc, the stocky Nazi, maybe lesbian Miss Tanner, a goth girl who likes to hiss like snakes, <laughs> the mute Romanian servant, whom will serve as the film's Uncle Fester, a terrifying, pissed-off-looking chef lady and her blonde, androgynous, dramatic child, and a lack of the Y chromosome. Hey, hey, you handsome young male character, there's no room in the script for you. She becomes friends with Sarah, whose hair likes to blend into wallpaper that looks like someone sneezed a floral fractal pattern. It's revealed that Sarah has been friends with Pat, whom she was the girl found murdered from yesterday. But before we can investigate further into the death of a student, we have a dance class to attend to! Auditions for Black Swap will begin shortly, but filming and post-production will be night for three decades. But before class can begin, we get this bizarre scene where the scary chef lady flashes her knife at Susie. Huh. Well, anyway, Susie begins dancing, but doesn't feel very good. After being pushed by the butch lady trainer to give us a real dance scene in this movie, she faints. The doctor tells her she had some slight hemorrhaging and gives her a needle. The other important detail is a unique item, a lighter watch, which the camera seems to emphasize as a plot point. Whatever it could mean. Later, after the girls talk in the room, there's another moment of silence. And, ooh, the camera is focused on where Sarah exited. What's gonna happen? I know something's gonna happen. I, oh, okay, well, I guess nothing. Something doesn't seem right, though, as we build up to something sinister. <gasps> Maggots! Falling from the ceiling! Oh, no! If we were corpses, they would totally be eating her! And then they're going to eat me! Oh, my! The second floor has been infested by maggots leaking from the ceiling, and so the teachers investigate the attic to find. Uh, wait, hold on, what's in the box? All of those cases of food by mail from a reliable firm that we thought to be honest. Obviously, it arrives spoiled. Uh, in a few days' really? time, you see what spoiled happened. Spoiled food? Oh, it was awful. Okay. <laughs> While the second mouth. floor is being fumigated, all the girls are relocated to a makeshift bed camp where turning off the lights means it goes red. Unusual lighting physics. As Susie goes under the cover, she must be contemplating. Wow, my first day I heard about a student getting murdered, fainted in class from hemorrhaging, and has my entire floor infested by maggots. Phew, what a day! Then we get a predatorial point of view as the music returns and we see some mysterious person sleeping behind the curtain of our two main characters. Sarah suggests it might be the directress of the school that no one has ever seen. And boy does she snore. <laughs> the next day... Or, if Stanley Kubrick were directing this... <laughs> Susie asks Madame Blog about last night, who says the director's was not there because she is currently on a trip. The next scene shows another build-up with the blind piano player's dog supposedly attacking the androgynous Germanic kid from behind a door, which leads to the piano player getting canned. Send it out, you and your dog! Do you hear that? Later that night, Sarah Cher was concerned about where the teachers go at night. She listens to their footsteps, but the sound goes away from the exit, meaning that they go somewhere in the middle of the night and always on schedule. What's cool about the plot detail is that I feel it could be the start of its own little story, almost like the beginning of one of those short urban legends where following the footsteps could lead to a surprise detention hall or something where the students are being eaten by the teachers. 
No, that's not the case here, however. But before they can investigate, Susie falls asleep as if hypnotized or drugged. Meanwhile, Daniel the blind piano player is at a bar drinking away his sorrows to... later hosen. When he walks outside with his dog, the music follows him as if hunting him down. The only clue we're given about any presence is a disappearing gargoyle and its shadow flying over the building, to which the blind man can't see anyway. But these are pretty cool and creepy effects that do so much more for the imagination and allows for so many scary opportunities as compared to, say, showing an animation of the statue. Looking at you, the haunting remake. Then Boomer can't take the silent treatment anymore and goes old, old Yeller's Revenge. Susie again talks to Madame Blanc and shares her concern about hearing the two words that she heard from Pat the night she died, Iris and Secret. To which the Madame doesn't know what it means, but to which she makes a phone call. But to who? After, she goes swimming with Sarah, who shares her concern for something ominous going on within the school, with the evidence of notes given to her by Pat before she died. However, before Sarah can show Susie the notes, they find someone has broken into the room and taken them. So instead, they want to listen and count the teacher's footsteps that night and figure out where they're going. But Susie falls asleep under a sleeping kind of spell again, leaving Sarah alone. Oh, the music was saying which. Is that a spoiler? The lights go out and someone is entering the room. Afraid, Sarah flees. She runs from room to room going green, red, blue. Kind of feel like I'm playing Simon, you know. Simon, we're trying to kill you. The silence is mind-scratching because the rhythm of the film tells us that something bad is going to happen. Examples here and here. We get a shot of a hand from off-screen holding a razor with <coughs> She locks herself in a room to which the hand uses its razor to release the lock, though taking its sweet time. Oh, yellow. That's a new color. She finds a way out, but- Oh, come on, you're a dancer. Leap on those boxes. She makes it through and only to- <coughs> Points for not seeing that coming. With Sarah gone missing, Susie needs someone else to talk to. How would you like to play supporting cats? Uh, nope. Too much young Y chromosome. Not gonna work. Shoot. Instead, she sees a friend that Sarah mentioned earlier, Frank Mandel, her psychologist. He tells Susie that the Tanner Academy was founded by a Greek immigrant in 1885 who was rumored to have been a witch, Miss Elena Marcos, also known as the Black Queen. She was persecuted and burned alive. But when the background story starts sounding too silly for him, we get another side character, a doctor who believes magic is everywhere. Magic is everywhere. The Coven's goal, he explains, is to achieve great wealth, even at the harm of others, and are powerful enough to hurt those who have offended them. At least they treat the blind as equal. And so on the... God damn, it's only her fourth night and we're almost done with the movie. She finally decides not to eat the food that's supposedly making her sleepy at night, but her disposal of it seems kind of not subtle. What's more distressing is that no one is around. Apparently they went on some kind of theater opening, but I don't know how she wouldn't have known about it. Then she tries calling Frank for help, but the power goes out and then she's attacked by a bat. More like a wind-up toy for your pet. After she puts the smack down on the bat from hell, she decides to count the teacher's footsteps and, well, damn, that's some good hearing, girl. She follows where she hears the footsteps, passing undetected by the scary ship lady. She enters the office of Miss Tanner to find she can't go no further. Ah, oh, carpets, the bane of eavesdroppers. But a green light tells us that the path is close. She remembers back to the night when she saw Pat and somehow now recalls the exact words. She finds a blue iris in the wall that leads to a secret path and, oh come on, now we're playing a Resident Evil game. She finds all the Academy staff members in one room, just in time to hear their evil plan. Wait, so why do they want to kill her? Because she heard of the secret Iris? Because of Sarah's influence? But the chef lady flashed her knife at her before there was any suspicion. So why attack her then? Were they targeting a foreign girl? For what? What do they want? What did she have to offer a coven of witches besides... youth? Maybe? Ah. Obviously this part of the plot is pretty big. She must they recite some cheesy incantation, and then we see a familiar face. Sarah's been promoted to sleeping pincushion queen, begging the question why they bothered to keep her body around, but does make for a pretty unsettling image.
She also sees the Romanian with Sarah's lighter watch, to which is a questionable plot point since she already discovered that Sarah's dead and that the entire staff is involved, so... pointless? She then enters the bedchamber of a wheezing granny, or the head witch of the coven as well as the elusive directress of the academy. If this is the main antagonist of the film, then her security really sucks. And to top it off, she's probably the most generic looking witch imaginable. Bad wrinkly skin, big nose, cackle. She wakes up and laughs evilly like the possessed girlfriend of Evil Dead. Shut up! She spouts campy lines of destroying her or whatever, some typical evil villain bullshit, but then in awkward silence. Wow. This is a pretty scary scene when a reanimated Sarah comes back to Michael Myers Susie. The scene's badassery is quickly faded, however, when Susie discovers the witch's reflection, revealing her to merely be invisible. She stabs the bitch and everything explodes. Nah, you sure this isn't an American film? Then she walks off in a very abrupt ending, laughing off the whole ordeal as the school burns behind her. Huh. Students will sure be surprised when they come back from their field trip. So that was Suspiria. And the conclusion? Oh, fuck. It was awesome. Not only does it captivate with its theatrical and dreamlike atmosphere, but the music and the colors make it a very sardonic piece. The action is fast, unexpected, and brutal as hell as the imagery leaves a lasting impression, which makes for some solid scares. One word that comes to mind when I think of this film is creative. The situations, the character archetypes, the deaths are all handled with care and finesse. As strange as the movie got sometimes, I was left wondering the possibilities. Imagine other death scenes and strange, dreamy sequences. In my opinion, this film could have gone on longer and taken advantage of the creative drive, especially since the plot was very meh. Too many questions are left unanswered, especially the nature of the coven and what the witch was capable of when we saw her animate a gargoyle, reanimate a dead girl, and turn invisible. But when seeking scares, plot's not the most important thing. Not as much at least as the moment to moments. Supposedly, this is the first of a trilogy of movies, also directed by Dario Argento. Um, the sequel's called Inferno and Mother of Tears, so maybe they have something to offer. Or not. Moving on, here are the pros, the cons, and the scares that worked. As for the pros, the build-up to each death scene, handled with aesthetic care, good pacing, and good payoff. The fairy tale ominous theme, at least to say, unique and strange. The poe -esque color lighting which felt very theatrical, atmospheric, and overall very memorable. The quiet moments effectively used and sparingly. A feeling of evil presence always there, but not clear, but always subtle, allows for the imagination to be exercised. Character archetypes like the Romanian, Blind Man, Nazi Roman, Madam, and the Emo Girl. The mystery build-up, a sense of impending doom and imprisonment without it being clear, only suggestive. A couple of potential individual stories, following the footsteps, hurting students, witches, murder mystery, chef, cooks, students, whatever. All good. And then the inevitable cons. The story details were not clear until there was a lot of exposition, not enough time with characters to remember them, not all character types were fleshed out or utilized, a goofy abrupt ending, wanting to see more creative possibilities while there was still mystery, before sequel when mystery is already answered, missed plot device opportunity, and a lame confrontation. And the part that matters most, the scares. Number one, the first death scene. Again, striking, well-paced, colorful, and cringing. Second, the gargoyle scene. An old suggestive technique that implies more than tells, allowing your imagination to actually have fun and imagine. The pincushion friend. Just imagine that coming out of your closet in the middle of the night. Enough said. And overall, the unsettling pace throughout the entire movie, to which a mix of the lighting and musical score, I believe, really added to the rhythm, making the entire experience feel like a bad dream. Either way, I recommend this movie to those who want a surreal, terrifying experience. And a weird one at that. Note to self, be nice to the music guy and the lighting guy. Next time, we'll take out one of the most terrifying things to come out of Hollywood. The remake. Magic is everywhere.